Hello, and welcome to the 2021 OCLC research update. We really appreciate your interest to learn about where we've been focusing these past several months and what's in store in the months ahead. My name is Sharon Streams, and with me here today are my three colleagues, Rachel Frick, Lynn Silipini conway and Andrew Pace. We are directors within the OCLC Membership and Research Division under the executive leadership of Lorcan Dempsey. The four of us lead teams that work together to advance OCLC research's common purpose, which is to accelerate and scale library learning, innovation, and collaboration that makes breakthroughs possible. And we do that by generating knowledge and evidence and models that libraries can use to plan with confidence and position with effect and by tapping into the power of the network, or rather networks, the networks of peers, networks of data, networks of libraries, networks of communities. Now we imagine you've been in many conversations that have acknowledged the enormous challenges of the past year and going forward. And rather than repeat that, we just wanna highlight three strategies that have guided our priorities and activities and really help us keep our momentum on goals and projects through these challenging times. Those three strategies are on the slide here and are also part of the title of our research update session. More than ever, the year 2020 highlighted the importance of convening as community, building understanding, and to share knowledge, ideas, resources, and support. Even though we were all forced to be apart, we remain firm in our belief that we're better together. In this session, we're gonna talk about some several specific examples of what that looked like in 2020 and how that will show up in the coming year. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Rachel Frick to share how the Research Library Partnership Program convened, learned, and shared. Thanks, Sharon. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about the community stories that we've been hearing from our research sharing network shares. I'm Rachel Frick, and I'm the executive director of OCLC's Research Library Partnership. For those of you who may not know, we are a program that supports a network of research libraries over 130 strong across the globe. We support our libraries in order to, so that they can meet our challenges today, providing those connections to knowledge in order to plan with confidence in a complex, rapidly changing ecosystem. And it might be an understatement, but this past year has been that complex, rapidly changing ecosystem that we need a little bit of support from our friends in order to meet those challenges effectively. The RLP leverages our partner knowledge in order to fuel innovation. We see people as those connections to knowledge, so we strive to create opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer collaborative learning so that we can connect strategic thinking to that practical application in order to influence service design and future research, as well as creating a shared understanding around these challenges in order to implement faster innovation. Our activities center in these four distinct areas, research support, unique and distinctive collections, next generation metadata, and resource sharing and collective collections. Today, I'm gonna to share with you stories that we've been hearing within our resource sharing community, SHARES. SHARES is our unique resource sharing consortium under the leadership of program officer, Dennis Massey, as well as the SHARES executive group. It is a network of large and medium-sized academic libraries, art and law libraries, as well as a few public library, library across five countries. We are more than a resource sharing network. Shares really shines because it brings together representatives from multiple sharing networks, and it creates a, a community of resource sharing professionals and a place to meet and learn from each other and share what we're learning in order to have rapid development and deployment of good practice. You can find more information about SHARES and its program and activities at the link provided here. 
But today I'm really going to talk to you about how this hallmark, this strong characteristic of connection of these professionals really came to bear and be seen as a great resource during the time of the pandemic as we started through the initial first phases. Working with the Shares Executive Group, Dennis Massey started convening town halls in order to support and facilitate knowledge sharing about what were the challenges to provide information and resource sharing services as we went into lockdown, as we started changing the way we were doing teaching and learning on our campuses, and basically to share what's happening on the ground, how are we changing workflows so that people didn't have to rethink these things all by themselves and to create a support network for people to share their challenges and problems as well as celebrate their successes. Between March and December, we've hosted over 50 virtual town halls and the topics have ranged, been long ranging. The best practices working group identified that there were so many good lessons that we've learned that we had to do be a little bit more intentional about synthesizing those highlights and expressing them so that in a way that people can absorb the lessons that were learned, the information that was shared in order to continue to improve practice. They're generating these heavy cues on these high interest topics so that we can all learn together. If you look back over the topics of these town halls between March and December, it's almost um, a, a thumbnail history of the issues that were being faced as we worked through the challenges of the past few months. As you can see in April, we were looking at providing services while working from home, going through sharing detailed plans for staffing and service position as we started to reopen some of the libraries, ending with how it was really hard to borrow whole ebooks and lend those whole ebooks. Some major threads that were consistent through all of these conversations was the call for empathy for each other across the resource sharing community and assuming that everybody was doing their best under difficult circumstances. They would assume that the vast majority of shared items would come back to the lenders, although the time it would take would be a while. And that borrowers, borrowers should pro prioritize physical returning materials to lenders and ask for renewals for those items only as time allows. Another great positive outcome was this map that was created with our colleagues in the product services area at OCLC. We learned from our shares network that knowing when a library was open, if they were borrowing, lending items to be borrowed, lending items, et cetera, and so forth, that status was really important and that it could change from day to day and being able to express that and raise your hand to say, yes, I'm open or nope, we're closed was really important. And we're happy to say that this map is still active and available at the link provided here. Going back to that model Sharon referenced earlier about how we convene in order to have, create a better understanding and then the really important part, sharing out. Dennis has really worked with the best practices working group and others to regularly share what we've been learning from these town halls. As you can see from the blog post from Hanging Together from April, September, and most recently the December post. We also have been sharing the conversations and the lessons learned through the OCLC Community Center, through the RLP website, as, as in addition to webinars tackling specific issues and highlighting those issues. As I mentioned earlier, we're also creating the FAQ documents, going through some of the highlights that were being discussed. Once again, that prioritizing of returning physical items and supporting health and wellness of staff. These FAQs are available at the link below. And I want to say a special thanks to our partners who helped author these and to synthesize hours of recorded conversations, which is Beth Posner, Lapis David Cohen, Meg Massey, Phoebe Walker, and Adam Mather. We haven't 
not only have we been having these intentional discussions with our resource sharing community, but we've been trying really hard to have a common set of questions to ask all of our communities that we convene under the um, Research Library Partnership umbrella. So I just went over some of the stories from our shares community, but we've also been asking the consistent set of questions to our ARC and architecture interest group, our research information management interest groups, also learning and hearing from our realm related conversations and other RLP programming that has been underway prior to the pandemic. In April, we asked folks, what were their plans for reopening? In September, we asked what were um, questions and uncertainties that still remained and what is the most challenging to resolve. And in December, we asked, this was our third question, what have you learned in trying to implement your plans? And we noticed that a lot of these answers tended to fall into these three threads of service areas, um, facilities, services, and health and safety. Communications, to no surprise, was a big, big thread that we heard. You know, being able to plan, it's been nice being able to share these lessons with our colleagues working for the Realm Project, with our research colleagues working on the new model library. And we'll be continuing to ask these questions of all of our interest groups as we walk through 2021 and the different stages of how COVID is affecting our lives. But the big meta lessons we've learned is really underscoring the value of just holding space and the importance of connecting human to human. As we work from home, it is really important that we create the opportunities for us to connect in a meaningful way. We also heard time and time again, and also take this lesson to heart ourselves, is that we have to assume that everybody is doing their best and that creativity and cognitive bandwidth are truly limited resources. With that being said, I wanna thank my colleagues at the Research Library Partnership, Dennis Massey, Rebecca Bryant, Chayla Weber, and Mercy Paracchini for helping me with this presentation as well as being stellar program officers and continuing to host and hold space for us to learn and share with each other. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Lynn Conway. Lynn? Thank you, Rachel. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today, I'm going to talk about a project that we have been calling um, the, a new model library. And so I wanna talk about transition and transformation and realigning to develop this new model library. First, I wanna introduce the project team. And I won't take the, the time now to mention all of the names, but you will probably recognize many of the faces. And this project is a group effort between research and colleagues in OCLC market research. And so without this group, we would not have been able to conduct this qualitative research study. So, Miriam Webster always comes up with the word of the year. And the word of the year for 2020 probably is no big surprise. Yes, it's pandemic. And that word has seemed to permeate throughout our lives in multiple ways. So for this project, we wanted to identify some of the hurdles that librarians were having to face that were brought on by COVID-19, but to also look at, as, as one of the library leaders who we interviewed told us, the silver linings behind all of this. And so we wanted to know how a group of library leaders are responding to the pandemic, how they envision these changes, their responses to a, a new model library that might emerge. 
Um, we've had many social and economic changes brought about um, and accelerated by this pandemic. So what do we mean by library model? It's basically the essence of what libraries are and how they're functioned. I'm sure we're all very familiar with the, the, the library model. Um, that's been a particularly persistent model. Um, people talk about libraries with books. They talk about libraries with people. They talk about libraries with programs. Um, and, and we still have those. But things are different. The modes are different. So we recently finished analyzing some data. And I'd like to give you a high-level summary of what we've learned from a group of library leaders and what they believe these changes might mean for us. We had 29 library leaders who agreed to talk to us. And these interviews that we had took place from April 23rd through July 27th, 2020. We had 17 of the interviewees from institutions in North America, eight from institutions in Europe, one in the United Arab Emirates, and three in Asia Pacific. They came from a variety of library types. 62% were from four-year academic institutions. So of those, 10 were research universities. Um, we had um, four, eight four-year colleges or universities. And we had three two-year academic institutions. And we had seven public library leaders and one library leader from a national library. We asked them if any of their staff had been laid off either temporarily or permanently. And of the 29, the large majority of institutions did not report having to lay off staff, although 17% did have to lay off staff either temporarily or permanently. Now we asked many questions in a, a pre-interview survey but I thought this was probably one of the most interesting. Uh, of course, they all closed. And the date that most of the libraries closed their in-person services was March 16th. So I've broken down the findings into five broad categories. And these categories or themes came up in the interviews. So they were basically centered around people, operations, space and activities, collections, and collaboration. So people, what does this mean about people? Well, big, big surprise, which I've already said, um, remote work. But not only remote work, but the reassignment of staff. So some staff were doing different jobs within the, the library. Some were actually, in some of the public libraries, the staff were actually going out and working with different agencies, um, helping distribute food, uh, going to, with the social workers. So there were very different types of reassignments. Also, some, uh, this came up almost with all of the library leaders. This importance on self-care. Staff were both emotionally and physically exhausted. So it was very important to pay attention to their needs. Also, dealing with change is very traumatic. And so there had to be a lot of discussion and communication, which was very important. And then there was this whole idea of being supportive of individuals who had other responsibilities, family responsibilities, aging parents, childcare, and that was something else. So people were really taking care of each other. This is a quote from a research university library leader in the UK. And 
He said, if you've got a three-year-old and a six-year-old at home, you can't actually deliver 100% work time on top of that. So he was saying how it was very important to help each other, think of individuals' needs, and see how we could transition and change. The next theme or category is library operations. And this has to do with the organization and workflows, budget and management. And the workflows had to be distributed very differently for many organizations um, during the pandemic. And so people moved away from departments and entirely uh, focused on projects. Um, so they had to start thinking more about the users, the community, what was needed, not about the specific functions of the library. So they had to broaden the way that they thought of services. Um, some of the leaders believe that blurring departmental divisions would make their staff more agile, more flexible, better able to adapt to changing environments and needs. Others believe the changes would, would enable them to increase their virtual service hours and be more available to users regardless of location. Almost all library leaders discuss budget, and I don't think that's a big surprise. However, said that they had experienced or anticipated little or no budgetary change. That was a surprise to me. About a third reported funding or revenue. Uh, the most common budget challenge, however, was not knowing what the long-term impact would be on the library. About Half of the library leaders took the opportunity to implement changes that they had been considering, and some others were planning to do the same. So they thought, this is a great opportunity to try these things that I couldn't do before. Some of the hurdles of managing were this whole idea of managing through uncertainty. So balancing the need to make difficult decisions quickly, um, helping staff respond to change. Again, much discussion about self-care. Uh, the library leaders emphasized um, the need for different types of communication approaches and how they had to keep staff informed of all the decisions that were going on. Talk to staff about their work and their life balance. And a major consideration was improving staff morale and helping staff stay connected to, to their teams and, a library, and the library as a whole. And these are some quotes, and I won't read them to you, but you can see that, that this four-year college library leader was saying, you know, this was an opportunity to break down some walls, to think differently. So to see that, more um, silver lining or positive side. The next theme is space and activities. And so that's, there are obviously library spaces and buildings, your virtual reference services, the programming, teaching and learning, research support, and library spaces um, and, and buildings. And one pattern that we kept seeing emerge from our data is that the libraries uh, was uh, the librarians were attempting to meet user needs for information technology, and one thing that really came up was the digital divide. And so we we've always known it's been there, but it really exacerbated this. And that was something that that the library leaders were very concerned about. You'll see that. This is another quote, and this is from a library leader in the two-year college. And so, again, it was thinking of the users, because at this two-year college, everything was done in person. And within 48 hours, they had to set up a virtual library. They had to set up virtual reference. When this library leader was talking to us, she had to pause 
to answer the phone, to answer reference questions. And this is how quickly the, the librarians had to move and make changes. This is a suburban public librarian. And again, this, this sense of community kept coming up. Um, and, and they've worked so hard to have this community. Are they going to lose this? How can they continue to create and, and develop this community if it has to be in a virtual setting only? Collections is, is the next theme. And again, no surprise with collections, it was this, this sh shift from uh, trying to get everything uh, digital. Now, then there's that, that one problem of the digital divide and those who cannot access this information digitally. Many people still want physical items, and that was a challenge since many libraries were closed. They were not offering curbside pickup. They were not offering interlibrary loan. Um, open access came up since this was also of great importance at this time. This is a quote from a research university librarian in Spain and basically was just talking about thinking about our collection strategy. Um, and, and this is something that she had been thinking about, but now she felt that this was the opportune time to take action. Collaborations was another area that came up, and it came up a lot. And many of the library leaders saw the pandemic as creating opportunities for their work with both um, library and non-library partners. And it gave them a chance to form new connections, deepen their relationships, and leveraging their partnerships to try new things and advance important initiatives that hadn't been understood by collaborators previously. And there was the article in the New York Times that talked about how the public libraries were so much far advanced than other community agencies when it came to dealing with the community in this, this pandemic situation. This is a quote from a, a four-year college library leader. And this individual um, is, is talking about that they were collaborating with other libraries. And this was a chance for them to tell their administration that, you know, here we are working with others, we're putting this together together. We are, we are not alone in this. We are collaborating. We have colleagues. We're helping each other. And that goes back to some of the discussion that uh, Rachel had mentioned with the Research Library Partnership. This is a quote from a library leader from a suburban public library in the Netherlands. And this individual um, is, is talking about pursuing collaborations and partnerships with commercial businesses and government agencies within the country. This also came up with academic librarians. And this is from an urban public librarian in the US. And so it was talking about the effort of their IT, their technology department, and what they were doing and how they took a major role in providing access, uh, not just to materials, but, you know, helping people get to information that they did not know how to get to, and how within the library they all work together. This is from a research university library leader in Japan was talking about um, how they're working very closely with other divisions, departments within the university, and how this had never, ever happened before. That, that's never seen such a thing happen. So, I want to talk a little bit about realigning to develop a new model library. 
So during these interviews, we asked library leaders to describe what library models might emerge in five years as libraries continue to adapt to the new, this new and changing environment. Well, one thing that we learned is that there is this acceleration of the trends that were already happening. As I talked today, you probably thought, well, we've been doing that, we've been doing that. Yes, we have. But the pandemic really accelerated these changes. And what we heard was it accelerated that need for the role of the library to be the center of the institution or the community hub. Uh, how they had to adapt from uh, this physical space of a library into a knowledge center. It also really accelerated this need to enhance the library's virtual presence. Also to grow the digital materials and to think of new ways of handling physical materials. So some libraries are doing um, check out automatically with physical materials where once the individual has that physical item, this individual can share and check out that item with a friend. So when this, when, if I'm done with a book and I want to give it to Sharon, I can do this with an app and just give it to Sharon. I can mail it to her, hand it to her. So libraries are thinking of new ways. Also, there's this dependence on um, emergency collections. And when I say that, people talked about the haughty trust, about consortial collections, and said they don't know how they could have survived without these. And also this development and growth of the library role in teaching and learning. Many library leaders talked about library staff helping faculty develop courses come up with support materials for classes, online classes. They said this wasn't happening before. Also assisting researchers in describing and making data available. They, researchers had time now to do this. Also the, um, tra this transformation, this shifting in staff responsibilities, organization, organizational structures, this resilience, um, libraries move very quickly to meet the needs of the communities. Often, the, they were the leaders for change within their communities. They were moving faster than any of the other departments or other agencies. Uncertainty. Well, as we talked to the library leaders, that kept coming up, this uncertainty and how there's going to be this importance of to continue to help staff to learn to respond and to manage change. Also, to manage low morale. There was also this talk of uncertainty with budgets and, and that unknown, those digital expenses for cleaning, PPE, online resources, and then again, the digital divide. What can we do to get what is needed to our communities? And these are just some quotes. This is from a suburban public library leader in the U.S. saying, you know, we want to be the place for people to come, not just this book warehouse or the provider of eBooks, but we want to be the place where parents can come to discuss things like their, their homeschooling. Uh, they want to be the hub of the community. This is a quote from a four-year college library leader. Um, and this individual is saying, is just talking about how we want to be there for our users and we want to meet their expectations no matter what. So some strategies for developing a, a new model library, well, training professional development, and, you know, that's, that's gotta be like now or else we've missed the train. Um, there's a lot of training, cross training that has to be done. If there are no funds for professional development, think about customer service. 
you know, work with staff on how to, to de-escalate confrontational interpersonal communications, how to help some of the users if they're feeling emotionally um, upset. I mean, these are things that, that we as librarians can help to diffuse and help to make people feel better. Again, the self-care, taking care of each other, take care of yourself, rotate schedules to help those with other child care and family responsibilities, schedule time for virtual coffees to share experiences. Um, one academic library opened the library following social distance protocols for bingo. Who would have thought, but these undergraduates loved playing bingo. And the librarians then took time out to let people know what was new in the library or what they could offer them. Host game nights, um, some are doing Dungeons and Dragons, with storytelling, use interactive books, show the books and, and, and not just you talking, have puppet shows. These are all different ways of thinking of a new model. It, we overwhelmingly heard about the digital divide and we need to think of new ways of delivery of materials. We need to deliver physical materials to homes and offices. We need to work to make broadband a public utility. We have demonstrated resiliency and how well we can adapt and pivot. And we need to continue to do this as we face new hurdles, which we will. I want to close with this quote, and I often quote Brian Matthews, and this is from a, pa a white paper um, from 2012, but I think this still resonates. We have to face the future boldly. We have to peer upwards and outwards through telescopes, not downwards into microscopes. So what's next? Uh, we plan to have an OCLC report on our findings in spring 2021, and we will continue to have webinars and discussion groups uh, for those interested in talking about this. Thank you for your time. And now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Andrew Pace. Thank you, Glenn. Today, I'd like to address all of the metadata lovers in the audience. As OCLC staff and library catalogers locked down, linked data efforts moved forward. But before I talk about our efforts through a tumultuous 2020, I'll be taking a look back at the last decade of activities around linked data research. 10 years of momentum that helped us carry on in times of uncertainty. A couple of caveats. This presentation accepts the premise that the library community is in the midst of a transformative change in the culture of knowledge work and metadata architecture. It's not intended to be a linked data primer or define the concepts that make up that effort. It's a review of a decade's worth of applied research that has led to the current effort to build a sustained, scalable production service in support of shared entity management infrastructure. One way to look at linked data is through its technical definition, a set of best practices for publishing data on the web that is interlinked with other data on the web to allow for more useful semantic queries. But for many, that may be either incomprehensible in one extreme or superficial in another. So another way to look at it is through the question, why linked data? The answer to that question is because it helps connect data. And through this process, you can connect isolated systems and services, which allows them to better connect to better connect people to libraries and libraries to each other. OCLC has been in this game for a long time, over a decade. And over that time, we have learned a great deal about what is needed to do linked data at scale. I'm going to review this history briefly here, but focus primarily on the last two years, leading to the culminating effort to put all of the research, experimentation, and prototyping to use in an effort that extends through the calendar year 2021. If you want more details on the decade's worth of projects, or even if you want some getting started primers on linked data, you can use the link that appears at the top of this slide. Our effort started over 10 years ago by making the data sets for the Virtual International Authority file, VOF, and the faceted application of subject terminology, FAST, available as linked data. This effort was extended by expressing WorldCat records themselves as linked data and exposing those entified descriptions through WorldCat.org. These efforts taught us what it meant to publish linked data on the web. 
12 years later, it is difficult to find a library linked data effort that does not somehow include VOF or FAST linked data. After that series of initial work, we started to investigate the use cases for linked data. The Entity JS project was a prototype to test WorldCat linked data for exploratory searching. We took WorldCat linked data for creative works associated with a topic and built new indexes for entities, including people, organizations, places, events, topics, and works that were represented in that data. We examined those entity relationships and built a user interface to search the indexes. Going beyond end user use cases, the person lookup pilot investigated how to make linked data accessible from other library systems. Our findings would prove important for later work. First, no single source is good at everything and quality varies by element type. Second, aggregating a lot of data creates context at scale. Context is key for disambiguating names. We also learned that language support is important, but labor intensive and inexact. In 2015, we experimented with workflows and processes to create linked data from scratch. We focused on how to balance the web scale networking and computing power of OCLC with the absolutely necessary human interaction of data domain experts, a necessity that was shown by working with special collections. This showed the lossy transition in normalizing data to Dublin Core and MARC. We also discovered that mapping to a common schema required a lot of local domain knowledge of the collections and associated metadata. Again, we found that aggregation adds tremendous value. We also learned that while it's possible to centralize the web applications for linked data work, these new models must support decentralized expertise in cleanup, mapping, and connecting linked data entities, especially for special collections materials. Knowing what we've learned about discovery of related entities, reconciling strings to things, and linked data creation workflows, Project Passage involved building a complete system based on linked data and using it to work out how bibliographic and authority data creation and use will change and support that paradigm shift. Immediately following Passage, and based on the feedback from the libraries who experimented with the prototype, we applied what we'd learned to descriptions of cultural heritage materials in an effort to figure out how workflows and scalability in identifying people, organizations, places, and works that aren't widely shared or known. And ultimately, the goal of any R&D investment, an opportunity to see those efforts pay off with a scaled, sustainable production service. I will go into a little more detail on these last three projects. By 2017, we were in a position where we had studied the various components of doing linked data at scale, creation, publication, and use, but we had not yet looked at the problem holistically to, term to determine how all of these components could be combined to allow for linked data curation. Project Passage used the Wikibase platform to evaluate how users could effectively create, edit, publish, and use linked data for authority metadata, all within a single unified system. It would take many slides to do this project justice, so instead I would urge you to take a close look at the accompanying report written by both OCLC staff and several of the library participants and published by OCLC Research in 2018. But here's a quick summary of the findings. We learned that the Wikibase linked data infrastructure can be used to create structured data with a precision that exceeds current library standards. The platform enables user-driven ontology design, but raises concerns about how to manage and maintain those ontologies. Supplemented with OCLC's enhancements and standalone utilities, the platform enables librarians to see the results of their effort in a discovery interface without leaving the metadata creation workflow. More robust tools are required for local data management. To populate knowledge graphs with library metadata, tools that facilitate the import and enhancement of data created elsewhere are recommended. The pilot also underscored the need for interoperability between data sources, both for ingest and export. And finally, traditional distinction between authority and bibliographic data can disappear in a linked data description. I need to point out that the strength of Project Passage came from our partners. Not only did they have lots of homework, put in lots of effort, and run several of our regularly scheduled office hours during the project, several of them also contributed their expertise as co-authors of the final report. As the newest effort undertaken, I'd like to spend a little more time talking about this linked data pilot. Before the passage report was even published, the feedback from libraries using that prototype led us to immediately sharpen some of our focus on certain types of collections. We started by looking back at the refinery project, 
and applying lessons learned from Project Passage and evaluating how these principles apply to cultural materials. This project envisioned and evaluated scalable and affordable systems and workflows that will be needed to produce rich and usable linked data for descriptions of cultural materials and their relationships to people, groups, places, concepts, and events. The linked data project's focus on sustainability and scalability raised six questions to investigate, among others. First, how divergent is descriptive practice across institutions and what tools are needed to make that assessment? Can a shared and extensible data model be developed to support the differing needs and demands for a range of material types and institution types? What is the right mix of human attention and automation to effectively reconcile metadata headings to linked data entities? What types of tools can help extend the description of cultural materials to subject matter experts? After transformation, are there new discovery tools that can help researchers find new or previously hidden connections through a centralized discovery system? And finally, what are the institutional and individual interests in the paradigm shift of moving to linked data? Please be sure to check out the new OCLC research report on this latest linked data experiment. In the meantime, let me review some of the report's main conclusions. First, testing the value proposition. Cultural material discovery and data management can be significantly improved when the materials are described using a shared and extensible data model, when metadata string-based headings are transformed to linked data entities and relationships, and when those entities and relationships are brought together into a single discovery system. Searches that use a persistent identifier rather than a string heading provide integrated authority control for the entities and greatly improves the precision and recall performance metrics for discovering. As digital collection string headings are reconciled and converted to entities, additional information from external data sources can automatically and efficiently enrich the entity description. This supports new discovery and data visualization capacities that would be expensive or impossible to achieve in current digital collection services. Turning to the shared data model, starting with existing Dublin Core and schema.org models did provide a solid set of initial classes and properties, and the model could be effectively and responsibly expanded based on new entities and relationships represented in the source metadata. When selecting and transforming metadata, these tools should be shared and the workflows decentralized in order to make the conversion scalable. Domain expertise is needed to determine how locally defined fields are used at the institution level and sometimes at the collection level. And as we continue this linked data journey, substantial resource commitments will be required to carry out these transformative data processes across all institutions and collections. But the community does not need to wait for the transformation to linked data to be fully completed before they can see the benefits. A paradigm shift of the scale will necessarily take time to carry out and calls for long-term strategies and planning. And since it's our theme today, the value of library participants as partners in this project cannot be overstated. As colleagues and thought partners in the work, participants connected with project staff and regularly scheduled office hours throughout the project. Project participants shared their thoughts on topics ranging from philosophical approaches and concepts to technical details and provided ongoing feedback that steered the project work towards tools and applications of the greatest practical value for library staff and researchers. Recognizing the critical insights contributed by the project partners confirms the importance of involving library staff in this manner for similar technical research projects. So one more thank you to the Huntington, to Cleveland Public Library, the University of Miami Libraries, Temple University Libraries, and the Minnesota Digital Library for helping OCLC and helping all libraries advance the state of the art. The final project I'll talk about today is actually not a research project, though several research engineers, data scientists, and domain experts are heavily involved. It's a culminating effort to see a decade's worth of research and development lead to a robust, scalable, and sustainable production service. This is the Shared Entity Management Infrastructure Project. In the words of our boss, Lorcan Dempsey, for linked data to move into common use, libraries need reliable and persistent identifiers and metadata for the critical entities they rely on. This project begins to build that infrastructure and advances the whole field. Half of the funding for this two-year project comes from the generosity of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to support OCLC's efforts in building a linked data entity infrastructure that will support the field. A rising tide floats many boats. The goals were largely furnished by the library community and built upon what we learned as part of the research which I've already described at length. 
We want to meet libraries needs, operate at scale and build a sustainable service and also complement the myriad of efforts happening in libraries and in knowledge work more generally. As you can see here, 26 different institutions, including public, academic, research, and national libraries are now part of our advisory group, and we will continue to stay in close communication with additional linked data organizations, including LD4P, the PCC, the elect directors of technical services at large research institutions, and others to ensure that this infrastructure will meet their needs. As a researcher, I can't help but take one more step back to look at these last three major projects not in juxtaposition, but as a linked continuum of effort. A lot of metadata description hinges on linking the short tail and the long tail together in order to improve the whole. So in this new linked data environment, we balance large shared homogeneous collections and data while accounting for a myriad of decentralized and heterogeneous collections. We improve machine learning and scaled reconciliation with the necessary tools for the dedicated knowledge work that happens in libraries. We can start in the big spaces involving person names and bibliographic works while acknowledging and preparing for the more difficult work ahead, like concepts and aboutness. And we can prepare for the pending paradigm shift that comes with blending bibliographic and authority work together and the challenges of balancing object description with an increase in contextual description. And across this continuum, we know that a large centralized infrastructure is needed and that custom applications will enhance the effort. All of this will facilitate a new kind of knowledge work in metadata management, discovery, and access in libraries. Wise developers will tell you that software is never done. Well, thankfully, the same is true of research. The entity project is well underway with one year left in the project, and we're about to enter an exciting phase of getting user feedback. When it comes to research, we have more and better algorithms to explore, more end user feedback to gather and analyze, and very soon, the web of linked data and libraries will be much, much larger than it was when we started a decade ago. And of course, all of these efforts will rely on even more convening of experts, more understanding of their challenges and priorities, and more sharing of our combined research efforts. And with that, I'd like to pass things on to one of our chief conveners, my colleague, Karen Streams. For the final segment of our update, I'm gonna talk briefly on what the Web Junction program saw in terms of library staff training and professional development this past year and what we're working on now as a result. As tens of thousands of library staff were sent home from work when the pandemic swept across the U.S. this past spring, Web Junction was swiftly flooded with <clears throat> sidelined library workers who were using their time away from normal day-to-day -day work to pursue professional development and ways to connect to their colleagues about emerging issues. Since our webinars, town halls, and on-demand courses are already virtual and free to anyone, it was an easy switch for us to accommodate the surge in participants. You can see that massive spike in learning activity uh, starting in March, uh, but in April alone, library staff logged a collective 144,000 hours of learning on Web Junction. For the year overall, we more than doubled the number of learners from the previous year. And each of those learners enrolled in more courses and spent more time learning than ever before. Even in the last quarter of 2020, activity remained two thirds higher than the previous year. We had more than 24,000 people register for one or more of the 15 live virtual programs we offered um, starting in March. Our most attended sessions were related to COVID-19 itself, including a town hall in April that had more than 3,000 people who participated in the poll questions, the interactive chat, and um, interacted with the discussion panel of library staff from across public, academic, and school libraries. That April town hall came just before the launch of the research partnership between OCLC, IMLS, and Battelle Memorial Institute. That partnership launched the Realm Project in May, where Realm stands for Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums. This project has involved convening, understanding, and sharing at an extremely rapid speed as we 
navigated the unknowns of the pandemic as it unfolded. To learn more this pro pro about the project, you can visit the website that's shown here. I also wanted to tell you about a new Web Junction project. Um, we just launched it um, a couple months ago, and with it, we'll be creating a series of on demand training courses that cover the impressive breadth of topics related to stewardship of collections. This project is made possible by a Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian grant from IMLS and our partnership with the Washington State University's Center for Digital Scholarship and Curation. We'll be developing these courses over the course of 2021, and we're designing them with small rural public library staff and the staff of tribal libraries, archives, and museums particularly in mind. The project I'm choosing to spotlight today is one that was well underway when COVID-19 hit, but has taken on a new sense of urgency in light of the effects of the pandemic on people's financial, domestic, and legal situations. 2020 ignited an explosion of civil legal issues arising from the spikes in unemployment, housing insecurity, medical debt, and incidents of personal safety and domestic violence and other topics. Public library staff are hearing of these concerns from their community members. The phrases on this slide indicate that civil legal issue is at play, but many public library staff might not know that when someone comes in mentioning these, um, these things and will not know what questions to ask to uncover the legal issues. We also know that public library staff can find these issues uncomfortable, difficult, and intimidating to navigate, both because you know, they can get really, it's an intimate nature of some of these issues, and also it gets into the complexity of the law. They are also concerned that uh, they might cross the line from providing information into giving advice that only lawyers can give. The situation has amplified the importance of a project that Web Junction has been working on in partnership with Legal Services Corporation since the fall of 2019. And that is a national training initiative for public library staff to learn how to expand community members' access to civil legal justice. The project is supported by funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation and the Susan Crown Exchange. We know that civil legal justice issues disproportionately affect low-income people in the U.S creating what is called justice gap. And that's the divide between the civil legal needs of low income people and access to the resources to meet those needs. The statistics are frankly startling. Uh, I'm gonna share a few data points that are from 2017. The impact of 2020 still needs to be measured. In 2017, almost three quarters of low income households had experienced at least one civil legal problem. One in four experienced more than six civil legal problems in that year. The percentages are usually higher for groups like seniors, veterans, and people with disabilities. 86% of the civil legal problems reported by low income Americans received inadequate or no legal help. Now, this problem is both broad and deep. For one, there are just not enough legal aid attorneys to help everyone. It's estimated that there is just one legal aid attorney for every 10,000 low income Americans. Also, people may not realize that they have a legal issue and not be aware of the available resources. And these types of legal issues may be intensely personal and emotional, hard for them to seek help. Library resources and the staff of those uh, libraries have distinctive strengths that position them well for helping to reduce the civil legal gap. I'm referring to things that you already know. One, that libraries are often primary and trusted providers of free access to information and the internet in their community, many serving as 
a go-to information hub. Also, you have the research, reference, and organizational skills of trained library staff and their understanding of the importance of distinguishing between information and advice. Law libraries are absolutely wonderful sources for civil legal information, but they're not nearly as prevalent as public libraries. Law libraries often are not as accessible, so some might be private or have very limited hours for public access. And of course, there are many communities that have no law library in their region. That being said, academic and public law librarians have been essential to this project and have been so generous with sharing their knowledge and experiences um, that they know will help public library staff to feel more confident and prepared to address the issues. I'm just gonna share a couple of examples of what this looks like when public libraries have impacted patrons' lives who have had civil legal issues and how just a little information, a little, a few resources and a little bit of confidence um, goes such a long way in empowering a patron to take control of a difficult situation. Luis Interiano of West Baton Rouge Library received his MLIS 11 years ago and his course course included an introduction to conducting reference interviews. And over the intervening decade on the reference desk, he has, of course, learned a lot on the job. Initially, Luis did not have much confidence uh, in, in, and found that the legal questions were rather intimidating. Um, one challenge he faced is that these civil legal questions often uh, or don't come across his desk all the time, and so the answers are not always on the tip of his tongue. As Luis works with patrons on legal questions, he's careful to provide disclaimers on the type of services he can offer as a reference librarian. And he told us of a time when he responded to a mother who had thought she was about to lose custody of her two-year-old daughter. And while understanding the distress of her situation, um, he calmly used his general reference skills to find authoritative resources and show her where to find forms and how to connect with the pro bono attorney. It all led to a positive outcome. You can read more about this story on Web Junction at the link on the slide here. Another example comes from a library in rural low income Maryland. The library staff there recognized a reoccurring issue in their job search center with patrons who couldn't land jobs due to their criminal records. This inspired the library to partner with Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service to offer cyber legal, legal clinics where volunteer lawyers offer virtual appointments to people who need help with the expungement process. So with the subject expertise provided by three law librarians, Web Junction developed a series of four on-demand training courses designed to strengthen public library staff's knowledge and ability to help identify when there's a civil legal issue at play and to direct library users to relevant, helpful information and services. The four topics are listed here on the slide. You can choose among them, among the ones that are going to meet your needs, or you can go through them in series. You'll find them all in the Web Junction catalog. As always, these are free and open to all. I wanted to talk about a related opportunity around this. And this is, you know, again, as we all do better working together, one thing you can do is learn with your peers by taking a on-demand training course together. This uh, group learning can provide the motivation to stick with the course through to completion. And it can be really satisfying and enriching to work through course materials with a group of co-learners. You get to form bond and create some community and all of that really heightens our learning readiness. Group learning can even boost our self-confidence. You know, we know the law can be quite an intimidating topic at the reference desk and a confidence boost is really helpful. Also, since so much of law is local with answers depending on where you're located and what jurisdiction governs the issue, it's really helpful if you're taking, um, taking the course with a group of local peers 
where you can um, bolster each other's knowledge of the, the local issues. So with that in mind, this March, Web Junction is hosting a three-week online training program to prepare, up, um, prepare people to be facilitators who will guide a group of their peers through one or more of the courses. This training session will describe the value of group learning, offer best practices in facilitating group learning, and how to foster and support a community of learners who share and support one another through the course as they put learning into action. This training program is suitable for frontline support staff, a dedicated reference librarian, or a library manager. It's also great for training coordinators looking for ways to leverage online content while building connections across a library, a system, or a state. We also welcome law librarians or legal aid providers who are interested in developing the legal reference skills of local public library staff. This course is also free. Um, it does require three weeks of online engagement that will have two live sessions, discussions, and assignments. That's happening in March. Enrollment is now open. It's also been very popular. So by the time you listen to this, it, we might have hit our enrollment cap, but go to the, to the link here to learn more. I also want to plug this podcast um, that's hosted by our partners at Legal Services Corp called uh, Talk Justice. A recent episode delves more into this topic and the speaker panel features Web Junction project coordinator Brooke Doyle. Check out our website for more information about civil legal justice and the learning opportunities for library staff that we offer. If you have any specific specific questions, you can email Brooke at this email address. That brings us to the end of our update. If you have any questions or comments about what we presented today, please send us an email. But with that, we offer our very best wishes for the 2021 year in our hope that we will have the privilege of connecting with you again soon.